Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of South by Southeast. Today we are in a very, very, very special location. We are at El Popular and I am here with Edward Garza. Thank you. Thank you for coming and chatting with us, Edward. Absolutely. No, I, I enjoy sharing <laughs> this little bit of history of El Popular. Yes, exactly. And that is exactly what we're here for because I know that you guys have been in the community for a very, very, very long time. and. Not a lot of people know the history of El Papalan. So can you tell me a little bit about how El Papalan came to be? Sure, absolutely. So it all started with my grandfather. So here's a picture of him. Uh, his name was Vicente, Vicente Garza. Okay. And he migrated from, uh, from Monterey, Mexico back okay. in, well, we have a lot of historical data on him. Uh -huh. So, and we're still working on getting more and more information, but we have border crossings because every time he crossed, he signed in with the border. Oh, okay. And so it's documented when he came and when he went back over oh. and what the dates and who he was with. And so we're, we've got a lot of information. And so it's telling us that he, he came into the United States, he had different type of jobs. So he was a true entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He had started a lot of small businesses. Okay. So ultimately, he did come into East Chicago, into the harbor section, oh, probably okay. 19, we we're thinking 1922. Oh, wow. So he, there was a big demand for people to work at Inland Steel. Yeah. So that was the big draw, get as many laborers into the area, but that wasn't the direction he wanted to go. His brother ended up working for Inland. Okay. So he was, he got involved. He was, uh, matter of fact, this picture here is a portrait of him when he went to work for First National Bank of East Chicago. It looks like a banker picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting because in this picture, and I don't know if it's because of the way they dress back in the day, mm -hmm. but he was probably around 21 years old. Wow. He, he looks more mature. He does. Yeah. He really does. So. Um, so that was one of the things he did. He was also a, um, he opened up a tailor shop mm. and he opened it up on, I believe it was uh, Dedor. And this was during the depression. Okay. So what he did is he didn't necessarily have you come in, fit you for a suit mm -hmm. and then make the suit back in those days you picked out a suit from a catalog. Oh. They they gave approximate sizes. They would send in the suit, and what he would do is do the finished touches. Gotcha. So lengths on the jackets and the cuffs and what have you. And so he bought all the equipment to do this. Mm -hmm. One day, his place of business was robbed. <gasps> oh my gosh. They took everything. Jeez. And the way my, my uncle, I have an uncle, uh, Vincent Garza, uh, it would be the son. The way he described it was that back in the depression, they took, they would take everything. And he mm -hmm. says, when he said everything, he means that when you walked into this business, even the garbage cans were gone. Oh even the gosh. garbage was gone. Jeez. He said it almost looked like it was swept clean. Mm -hmm. Well, here he is. He doesn't know what to do. He just lost everything he invested. Yeah. And he had a friend that was in the jewelry business. And as a, just to get a job to start making money, the, the jeweler gave him a, an opportunity to buy or go out and buy uh, precious metals, whether it was okay. silver or gold. So it's basically what even places do today, they'll buy scrap metal. Yeah, and then they, take them in. And they pay. Well, that's how they were also doing it back in the day. Okay. That went on for a little while. And he decided that because he came from a background of food, his family was in the different uh, recipes of food back mm -hmm. in Mexico. He decided he was going to get into that business. Oh. So he started off with the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So his number one item was chocolate. It didn't doesn't didn't look like this. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to try to come out with a packaging that sort of a retro look oh, okay. on what it looked like back when, when he started. Out, yeah. So he started making chocolate in his little shop and. Then he went into making mole. Mm. So his mother had a recipe that was already over 50 years old back oh, then. Oh, wow. So he, 
so today we're almost at 150 years just on the same recipe. That's crazy. My grandfather was really big into natural foods. Yes. Even back in those days, he did a lot of study on preservatives, what it did to the human body. It, he, it, it, it was a sort of a obsession with him. Mm -hmm. So he made sure that all his products were made with uh, natural ingredients. And those same recipes that he created back in the day are still being used today. That's amazing. Yeah. And that was what I think we noticed when we were doing our um, hot chocolate challenge. We noticed that El Papulat had all natural ingredients. And I feel that that's very rare to come about today because not a lot of chocolate companies, um, specifically the ones that we were using to do our little challenge, use natural ingredients. And I think that that's a very great thing to have, you know, now so that you don't have to rely on preservatives and just know that everything that is going into your body with the chocolate is natural. Yes. And I, I, I appreciate that, Edward. Yeah. Well, thank you. We, we hear this all the time. Um, there is, uh, people are looking at labels. Yeah. And another thing we don't do is we don't put fillers in our products. You'll. You'll see other chocolates, they'll have fillers in there you probably can't even pronounce. Yes, I, I and, had a problem with that. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, we're talking about something very simple. Uh, there is sugar, chocolate, cocoa, almonds, and cinnamon in this product. Yeah, and that's literally and it. And that's it. Yeah. But it's the way in which we formulate this. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to make chocolate. There's a, It's actual science mm -hmm. because you can easily burn chocolate. Oh, yeah. And so there's there's different ways to make sure it's right. Then you have the process of putting it in certain molds, um, the way that you temper it, and then it then you go into the packaging process. Yeah. But that was that was the second item he was involved in, and he also started making Kessel Fresco. Oh, okay. So the Kessel Fresco, he worked with a farmer in in those times we suspect he was located somewhere in Highland. Oh, okay. And in those days it was just all cornfield. Yeah. I mean just nothing what you can even I mean, nothing what, what you see today. Yeah, it just didn't that's exist. completely different. And so he would go out into the country. He would get his milk. He would make his Kessel Fresco. He would make it in his shop, pack it. And um, then he started on the chorizo. Oh, okay. Started making his own chorizo. And again, everything was done inside of his shop. He would load up his car. He would take off and go down to the uh, uh, downtown Chicago. Oh, okay. And back in those days, they would sell product on the street corners. Mm -hmm. And that's where he started. Um, there were not a lot of stores that you could sell to. It was mostly done on the street. Okay. So, uh, and there's a lot of old photographs and different things you can see of Chicago where a lot of commerce occurred just in public. Mm -hmm. And so that's where he started. Um, as as time went on, he ended up marrying the love of his life, oh. which was from Chihuahua, Mexico, mm -hmm. brought her to the United States. They um, started a family. Mm -hmm. They had um, seven children, and they were all involved in the business. Okay. Ultimately, the, the sons were the ones who uh, developed with the business as they went forward. Okay. So they developed not only these four items, but they also started importing products from Mexico. Okay. So some of the brands you may be familiar with that you may see in the stores like La Costeña, uh, San Marco Jalapenos, Herdes uh, Jalapenos and Salsas. And, mm -hmm. and then we imported a lot of chile, like chile ancho, chile guajillo, chile de arbol, and we would repack a lot of those products under our own brand. Okay. As time went on, they started getting into more items. So they had in, they started to sell uh, canned pinto beans. Oh, okay. Um, hominy, garbanzo, uh, black beans. They sold a lot of dry bean. Um, they were very big into the fideo. Oh, yes. Okay. All your different type of, I mean, I still remember as a young kid, there was ABCs and melon seeds and conchas and, and the rings stars. and st yeah, <laughs> estrellas. And they had all these different items. And um, so they developed a line probably somewhere between three and 400 products. Wow. 
as the company progressed through time, um, they slowly, my grandfather eventually became ill. Mm -hmm. He was uh, diabetic. And back in those days, there there was no detection for diabetes. Oh, wow. There was no treatments. There really wasn't insulin to speak of. Um, so those were the primitive days. And he did succumb to the, uh, uh, the disease. Wow. So 1968 is when he passed mm -hmm. and his four sons continued the business. Okay. As the business went forward, the son started to sell their shares of the business to my father. Oh. My father was the oldest of the sons. My father became sole owner in 1981. Okay. So um, at that time, my father, he, I was in college at the time, and he called me, he says, I want to consider buying the business and being the sole owner of it, but I need your help and your brother's help. Mm -hmm. So we decided to really focus on the family business and started taking us, I switched majors, went into a, a more of a business curriculum. And we, we worked with my father through about 2002. Okay. And there was another shift in the business. Um, my brother was no longer involved. Unfortunately, he had an accident, mm -hmm. which uh, he became disabled, mm -hmm. and I took the business over, uh, I believe it was ja January 2002. Okay. And I ran the business the way he did it for about a year. And I, I thought, you know, we've got some great products here. Yes, definitely. And the only way I'm going to really get the word out is to put all my focus on, let's say, four or five items, mm -hmm. as opposed to 300 items. So that was the idea. We took our catalog line and dropped it down to about four or five. I ended up investing in a USDA federal meat inspection inspected facility where we focus on making chorizo. Okay. Um, my grandfather made the chorizo under state inspection, but we decided let's do this on a national level. And to be able to do that, you need a uh, uh, basically permits from the federal government. Okay. The federal government, what they do in meat plants is we have an inspector on site every day. Most companies, they just produce, maybe they get inspected once a year, but with El Popular, we, it's mandated that there's a federal inspector who watches the process. So we are, um, we have very stringent programs built into El Popular, including the fact that we also been audited uh, for um, one of the the probably highest honors as far as food safety certification in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what's called uh, SQF certification. Oh, okay. So today, if you want to work with Aldi's or you want to work with Walmart or Sam's Club or Costco, you have to be SQF certified right. to get to those doors. So we've been in those compliances. Behind you, there's uh, seven uh, certifications. So in the last seven years, we've We've been down that road really working well to hone our skills on making sure that our product comes out uh, just the way we intended to. Um, right. So the business shifted in 2002. I take over the business. We were a company that was really, um, our product distribution was mostly Northwest Indiana and all of Chicago including a large part of the suburbs. Okay. So I wanted to go beyond that. Yeah. I wanted to go, you know, uh, start reaching out to the Midwest. So today we, we are in most of your Midwest states. Our product is very well on the East Coast. So we oh, sell okay. a lot of product in Massachusetts, Boston, all the way coming down from uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, you know, as you go into Delaware, uh, oh, Pennsylvania, wow. all those areas, Virginia, down into the Carolinas, mm -hmm. you can find El Popular products. That's awesome. Um, we are conducting business in Texas. We're working with uh, several chains. And uh, so we're, we're slowly continuing to grow, but that's part of our plan to reach out beyond just the Chicago just the area. Midwest, yeah. 
So it popular because they started 1925, and uh, we we know we have history, mm -hmm. but you never think about it because you're so busy in business, you're just conducting business. Mm -hmm. So back in 2011, our governor, state of Indiana, uh, Mitch Daniels, reached out to El Popular and wanted to present us with a an honor of being the oldest Mexican business in the state of Indiana. Wow. That was very, very nice. We, yeah. It was, it was a great honor. We went down to Indianapolis and we were presented this award. And the governor said, not only do they believe that we're the oldest in the state of Indiana, but possibly the entire United States. That's amazing. So then there were a couple organizations that got involved to do the research. Mm -hmm. And so as of today, there's, it's, it seems undisputed that we are the oldest. That's amazing. There's still research being done, but we're not able to, at least at this time. There is a possibility there might be some ranches in Texas. Okay. You know, where maybe it was a family-owned ranch for many years that's been passed down. Right. But there's nothing that's documented that, that really proves that. But we know, and definitely, when it comes to the food industry, we are by far the oldest. What they're all doing research on, which is all flattering, is not only the oldest Mexican business, but potentially the oldest Hispanic business. Wow. So it's it, the history is interesting, and we still try to gather as much. Last year, about this time, just before the COVID, I'm talking about a week or so. Oh, gosh. We had, we had a young <laughs> lady come in from the, um, uh, from Indianapolis, why her name is escaping me right now, Nicole. And Nicole works with um, the state of Indiana's, um, it's not their historical society. It is a historical site. And she's been working with me on gathering information, not only about El Popular, but also Northwest Indiana. She oh, okay. really has a focus on the Mexican community in the harbor, especially, because oh, that's okay, where yeah. everyone came. So she came here last March and she said, I got a surprise for you. Oh, I yeah. said, that's great. Because <laughs> at that time, all our information showed that my grandfather started in 1927. Uh -huh. I mean, everything. We even have a photograph of a float with a license plate that showed 1928. But we know he had started the year, before. In the year before. So she brings in this newspaper ad from back in 1926. Uh -huh. And it, it was an ad that came out in January of 1926. It's my grandfather thanking his customers for buying product the previous year. Oh, so wow. it was like a New Year's Eve or New Year's ad. Uh -huh. But it was thanking him for all the business that they gave in 1925. Uh -huh. So now we went from basically at that time, 93 years or 94 years. And adding on more We years. just added two more years. Uh -huh. Well, we know that the newspaper that published this ad had just started in 1925. Okay. So we're not exactly sure if... So it's it even just goes dating beyond the that. newspaper, but it's not giving you an exact date of when he started. Right. So it's we're still working on it. Wow. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's a lot of archives at Indiana University Northwest in Gary. Okay. Where they have uh, all the publications of every newspaper that was ever published. Oh, okay. But because of the COVID, they've restricted people from going in. Mm -hmm. So once the restrictions are lifted, I'll I'll be going in and looking up and, and seeing if there was any more ads or articles that can give us more historic information that's pretty solid. Right. And now, Edward, tell me about the products that you've decided to focus on for El Papalán, because I know that we have quite an array here, and I know that we've eaten quite a majority of them. <laughs> well, thank you. So, so it was you, all these Yes, years. it was us. We were just buying up all of the chorizo and all of the chocolate. Well, I'd like to thank you. And my <laughs> grandfather would love to thank you. Um, no, let me give you a little background. So when my grandfather started his original formulation, that's why we call it Chorizo Original. Yeah. Is because this was his recipe. The original recipe. Yep. Okay. As years went on, and this has a little bit of heat. 
So there were some people thought, you know what, this is a little too hot for me. I, it would be nice to have a mile. So mm -hmm. as the years went on, um, I don't have that mile here. <laughs> but assume the mile is here. Yes. Okay, so it progressed from there. We okay. decide, you know, there's a lot of other opportunities. People are looking for, maybe they're not wanting to eat pork. So we came up with a beef option. Oh yeah, we So that we way. offer the beef. And it's it's my favorite. Um, from there, we went, we, we were getting requests for product that was hotter than the original. That's crazy because I know that my husband, I think we told you the story, he went and bought chorizo, not looking and paying attention to the packaging, <laughs> and bought the extra spicy one. The one, the one the with super, the flames? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one looks like a bonfire. Yeah, okay. and he's like, oh yeah, this is the regular chorizo. No, it was not. <laughs> I did not partake in that eating of chorizo and eggs that day because of of this one. That yeah. one. <laughs> I understand. You, some some people need a fire extinguisher. When yeah. They but I got to tell you, there's a growing demand for this product. And that's crazy to now, me. Now, if you cook this up and you just put the chorizo in a tortilla and mm -hmm. ate it as a taco, yeah, it's going to be hot. But if you mix in with food and you portion out accordingly. Yeah, portions. This is a great. Portions are important. <laughs> So we we went after the needs of the, the, this group, and then we um, we also decided because we had uh, again this is public demand, people looking for either chicken or turkey, yeah. And so we decided to come out with the that chicken be, formulation. Yeah. Chicken. I didn't yeah. even know that there was a chicken version. Oh, this is great. The thing I like about the chicken chorizo is we chicken has very little fat in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to add a little bit of vegetable oil to the right. to the product. Otherwise, it would burn in a pan. But what I like about the chicken chorizo is you can cook it up, but this is really ready to go in a tortilla as a chicken taco. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a, That's awesome. a very good option for that. As time progressed, we came out with a, a uh, el popular longanisa. So this is more of a grilling sausage. Yeah, I noticed that. Mm -hmm. I don't think we knew about these either. Where are you hiding these, Edward? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I get that. That's a question that comes up all the time. Where can I get it? I didn't know you had it. Yeah. So, longanisa is a little bit, uh, there's a lot more uh, time involved to create this. We okay. have to create the chorizo. We have to hang the product, let it hang for about three or four days. So, it what they call in industry blooms. Oh, okay. So, you get the, the beautiful colors. You get the, the right flavors. You lose a lot of moisture. Mm, and now okay. you're getting down to a lot of just the, the protein. And then it, once it's ready, then we package it. Okay. And um, But this is a great grilling. It and looks Especially good. in the looks, summer, you, this is very enjoyable. It looks like a Mike sausage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those I cook up and I, I love putting, I like corn tortillas, but mm. I, this goes great in a flour tortilla. Okay. We'll have to try those yeah. out. So then um, we end up adding additional lines to our brands, to our line, and we came up with a brand called Aguila Mexicana. Mm -hmm. So Aguila Mexicana, this product was designed to uh, compete with products that were coming out of Texas and out of California. Okay. Those products are made with, uh, are made with glands. Mm. So they're made with uh, uh, salivary glands, pituitary glands, lymph nodes, uh, things that are normally... Not part of a sausage? Not part of anyone's diet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it because it was so cheap, the ingredients that these companies just decided to make it and mm -hmm. spice it up. Well, I, we don't believe in that philosophy here. Mm -hmm. We're going to put out quality products. Um, but I still had to compete with this company because I'm I'm going up against products that may cost three dollars yeah. versus something that costs a dollar. Right. So we came up with a blind called Aguila Mexicana. It was presented to the Walmarts. Oh, okay. To compete with let's their brand there's one out there called Cacique. And this product has pork, number one ingredients pork, and we do add we have about ten percent soy protein. Mm, okay. So it's a it's a it's a uh, uh, soy is a fantastic protein, and it's healthy. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we just felt as a way to control pricing, we would include the soy. Mm. The product is done so well that there was a demand for an all soy product. Mm-hmm. So we decided to do that, which is this product here. Yes, the shwe- the soy chorizo. This it is, is chorizo. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> you can cook this product up and many people can't tell the difference between a pork and the soy product. That's awesome. It did so well, we decided to come out with it under the El Popular brand. Mm-hmm. So the El Popular, we don't call it soy. We we refer to it more as a vegetarian chorizo. That's good. A very similar uh, recipe profile. This is this could possibly be our fastest growing uh, line that we have. There are a lot of people that not necessarily vegetarians, with, and, I, and I don't know the terminology, but there are some people that in a course of seven day week, they may only eat meat twice a week mm-hmm. or once a week. And they right. refer to more of a vegetarian diet the rest of the week. So we're, we're catering to a lot of those groups. The people who love to eat in popular original chorizo mm-hmm. are still gonna have the same experience eating the vegetarian. The meatless, and that yeah. is amazing because I feel like, like you said, it, we're, you're just growing with the times and I feel like that, that type of um, brand of chorizo or meatless chorizo is becoming more in demand. That is correct, yes. Um, So where can people go to look for El Popular in the markets or is there somebody somewhere close by that somebody can go to find all of these products? Now it is difficult to go to one location Mm -hmm. to find everything. Now there are some. For example, Pete's Market. Okay. It's, It's a great place to buy they they basically uh, are are big fans of it popular yeah. so you'll find most of the the sausage products it peats you'll find the molas on in the grocery aisle you'll find the chocolate and uh, I didn't speak of the spices okay so we we came out with a chicken and steak seasoning now we're in the spice business because it takes a lot of spice to make chorizo. Right. So it was a great opportunity to come up with a very flavorful uh, spice blend for chicken and steak. Yeah, and I think that just makes sense too so that everybody can kind of know your secrets. Not all the Yeah. <laughs> Big, no, it definitely get, gets them closer. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have another item that's coming out. It's very similar. It's called adobo sazon. Oh, okay. So it, it's going to give you that flavor of the um, of the seasoning, but it's also going to give you that color that people are looking for. Right. Some people are looking for a very strong red color in their mm-hmm. meats. That that will provide it. Um, so then other stores that you can find this product, uh, Jewel Foods carries the uh, the original, the mild, and the Aguila Mexicana. Oh, nice. Okay. Yep. And then you have um, you have like for example La Sinega. It's a yes. very good customer, very old customer. They've been uh, working with it popular for decades. And uh, a lot of the products are available there. And then a lot of your smaller uh, grocery stores, if you're, you know, let's say Northwest Indiana, you mm-hmm. have, you know, Tarimoro, La Mexicana, you have yeah. a lot of your smaller stores we do sell product to. Um, and then again, uh, throughout Chicago, you can go into Tony's Foods, uh, Cermak Produce, um, you know, I can go on and on. Yeah. Uh, we have a very strong presence in the, in the Chicago or Midwest market. And that's that's yeah. great to hear because yeah. I am going to try and buy up all of this chicken room. Absolutely. And this one maybe yeah. for Mike, you know, because he, I know he likes sausages on the grill. Well, I should also tell you, if you go into a store and you can't find it, mm-hmm. It's easier for you, the consumer, to ask for it, and they'll bring it in for you, oh, as okay. it is for me to say, "Can you bring this in?" Right. They listen to the consumer, so you are, you demand. guys are the boss. Yeah. Ask for it by name, and they will bring it in. So, Edward, you did mention a quite a few places from our area, like uh, Cienega, Jewel. Um, I know that there was a couple other places that all the delicious El Popular products are. So, tell me a little bit about your history with the company and how all of you in the company came to be. Okay. Um, you know, being born and raised in this business, I would, I obviously I would see my father go to work, yeah. come back. 
he would work. There was many times where he was gone before I woke up and he would come back after I was asleep. Oh, wow. Because they just, they worked. They were very passionate in what they, and they were developing the business. So mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a challenge. Yeah. Um, there were times where, as a, as a young child, uh, probably nine years old is when I started on a temporary wow. basis. Very super young. Yeah, it was, but it was enjoyable because as a nine-year-old, I'm making a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> buying your penny candies. Yeah, it was. Yeah, as a nine-year-old, probably gets confused on what to do with a little bit. No, it was a little bit. It was more to go out, work, do something. It was always on a Saturday. Yeah, and to learn the responsibility That's of right. being in the business. That has a lot to do with it. So I would, I would get up on a Saturday morning. I would go with my father, and usually we only worked half a days on Saturday. Part of my job was to blend the secret recipe part oh, of the chorizo. So, so you do know the secret. Oh, I yes, I do. <laughs> and it's actually in a vault. So, um, and what it's it is vault. is... So remember, you cannot get them, Mike, over there. He's always trying to get secrets out of people. <laughs> this is a tough one. So um, the family would make one specific part of the recipe. Mm -hmm. All the other components of the recipe were pretty general. Chili, okay. pepper, garlic. But there was a there's a secret blend that it's that blend of flavors mm -hmm. that people enjoy about the chorizo. Okay. My grandfather set it up just perfect so that nothing stood out. Right. It was all just a perfect blend. So that was my job on Saturdays was to create that blend. Oh, okay. And as time went on, I became more involved in the business. You know, when I was in high school in the summers, we I'd work um, in the warehouse or in production, or I would get involved with uh, help what, working with a driver as a helper on a truck. Okay. And so I, I got to know a lot of Northwest Indiana mm. and South Chicago. There yeah. was a lot of business in South Chicago. It was amazing how many Mexicans lived and there was so much commerce on on uh, commercial avenue uh 91st 90th 89th all the way down to 87th yeah. to my memory and uh it was just just part of what we did mm -hmm. you know you know your summers were going to be there but then i went from you know really as i got older 16 years old i got involved in being a driver oh okay getting involved in sales um, and I got to meet a lot of the people, and that was probably the best part of it. Um, some of, some of the, well, maybe a lot of those people are no longer with us, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of history there, and I got oh, to yeah. learn about their history. A lot of these people came from Mexico, and they had a story to tell. Mm -hmm. You know, I think everyone could probably, my father used to say this, you could write a book about everyone's life. Yeah. And it's amazing, the stories of their struggles and how they were able to open up their own store and grow it and how they were able to educate their children. And yeah, and, and they, um, there was a lot involved in the history. And it still is, it still evolves today. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's why we do a lot of what we do. It's just to hear the stories that come out of the small businesses that have grown from you know a small little tiny store much like El Popular it's it was you know selling on the streets and then you guys have grown into this huge company that is across the Midwest and the East Coast and it's going to just keep expanding and I feel that's something that our small businesses in the area can look forward to and you know maybe one day they'll be at the same level that El Popular is that they're distributing to different areas in the country um, but I do want to thank you for all of what you've done here today. Where can people go to find you on your media platforms? Yeah, I, I tell you, one, one of the things we're trying to is direct a lot of people to our website. Yeah. So it's at popular.com. Okay. Where we, we offer a lot of recipes. It does talk about the history. Oh, okay. We're still adding new items to the, to the line, uh, to the, to the site. We're going to bring in some videos on mm. how to okay. how to create different items, but our recipe library is growing. We're always looking for ideas on chorizo yeah. or any product. Mole, um, it's amazing. Mole was just a chicken item. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
if you go online, you're going to see different recipes on how you can use it as a sauce for tacos or uh, dipping sauces. Mm, it, yeah. It's going beyond what it used to be. But we welcome people to work with us uh, also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for ideas, um, you know, different concepts, things that we think could enhance our product line. Right. And so, yeah, so, you know, we're with Facebook, Instagram, uh, we have uh, some videos on YouTube. Oh, okay. And also um, uh, with Pinterest. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again, Edward. I yes. do want to mention our patrons. We have quite a list, so I'm going to go through them now. Um, we have Hegwish Nutrition, Willie G, Stevie's Michi's, Dog Apparel Company, Poco Picoso, OMG Pastries 31, Vive Life Photo, Crystal Visions, M Matthew Rise, Ice Cream Time, Buzz and Barbecue, Stella Garcia, Hair by Lynn 29, Bidia Ocotlan, Keepsakes by K, The Taco Dive, South Ave, Servant Sweet Treats, Jen Guzman, Memos Jr., Flip Smokehouse, Tommy Talks, and Voyager 783. So again, thank you, Edward, for having us here at your facility. Well, Bobby thank you Lard. for coming. Until yep. um, next time, I guess. Absolutely. Look forward. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. This is another episode of South by Southeast.